On Monday, the first trials of a possible vaccine for the coronavirus got underway. On Thursday, the president said the FDA will move quickly to see if drugs already approved for other illnesses might be effective in treating COVID-19. And several pharmaceutical firms reported that they were experimenting with various medicines to treat the infected. Well, one of those companies is Royvent Sciences. Its founder and CEO, Vivek Ramaswamy, joins me on Skype now from New York. Vivek, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thank you for having me. Let me start by asking you, obviously, this is a, an escalating crisis that we face here. What is, what, what do we, what is, what needs to be done immediately? And, and how do you rate what, uh, how do you measure the response that's been going on so far? And what further measures need to be taken to limit the impact of this virus? Yeah, so I think the first thing I would say is, yes, we're a little late to the game on testing, but widespread testing as soon as possible is still of essential importance. I think one of the things that we got to take away is first humility. We have at every step of this crisis so far learned things that were new that we didn't expect at every step of the way. I think that humility is going to serve us well. And as it pertains to testing, I do think there's a couple of lessons that have begun to crystallize as well which is that widespread testing could have prevented the viral spread at an earlier point in time than, than we ultimately did, and we failed to deliver that test. But there's a lot of reasons why, but, but to me, I think the main lesson is still pretty simple and one that we can still apply, which is to lead innovation to the private sector, ultimately working collaboratively, both with government and with private enterprises to deliver solutions sooner. So uh, on the test, yeah, go ahead. Let, I want to come on to that. I want to come on to the, the things that, that the private sector may be able to do. But just in terms of what we're doing right now, we do now seem to be certainly in New York and California uh, and presumably in much of the country soon too, uh, in full kind of suppression mode. We're basically isolating people as far as we possibly can for uh, a considerable period of time. Is that sure. going to be enough, do you think, to ensure, and this is obviously the principal challenge here, that we don't, that, we, that, that as the infection rate increases and the people who are sick increase, uh, we don't overwhelm our, our medical facilities? So I think we need to be making judicious choices about what actions we prioritize right now. Of course, we should be doing everything possible, but we also need to prioritize. I think, first of all, we need to focus actions disproportionately on the elderly and high-risk patients. We know patients with compromised lung function are at greater risk. We know that elderly patients are at greater risk. We need to be focusing disproportionately on the patients we know who are at risk. I think we've already seen the military being put in place to provide extra hospital bed capacity. I think that's where we ought to focus. We're past the point where this can be 100% contained, but we're not past the point where we can still invest in ICU capacity, hospital bed capacity, converting operating rooms which are equipped to double as ICUs, to serve as ICUs. I think that's another place we ought to be investing. And it's not too late to be investing in therapeutics either. So I think those are a couple of the areas where we still can focus to actually be effective in terms of therapeutics, hospital capacity, and a disproportionate focus on those who we know are high risk already. As you say, in comparison with many European countries like Italy and certainly China, we bought ourselves a bit of time here. On this issue of therapies, what kind of therapies are there? What are showing promise? How quickly might we be able to get them? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of therapies in development. Let me break it down into a couple of buckets. On one hand, you have vaccines, which prevent people from contracting the virus, from getting the disease. There's two kinds of vaccines, what are peptide-based vaccines and what are known as nucleic acid or RNA-based vaccines. In this case, we've seen much more rapid production of these RNA-based vaccines, which really show that a principal, that's a principal advantage of using RNA to create a vaccine. The flip side is an RNA-based vaccine has never really demonstrated efficacy in other disease areas. So we are charting truly uncharted territory here, but I think the progress we've made quickly is promising and exciting. On the other hand, we have therapeutics, which are actually treating people who have been infected. And in therapeutics, I would break it down in terms of two broad categories as well. First, there's therapeutics that directly target the virus itself. And second, you have therapeutics that target the immune system and in particular, preventing the immune system from resulting in acute lung injury, which is ultimately what's going to kill patients with COVID-19. And are there yeah, drugs already out there or they're in, in development that can do that? So on antivirals, there are drugs. There's actually a, a recent studies coming out for hydroxychloroquine. This is an anti-malarial that's showing potentially quite potent activity 
against this virus in particular. Generic drug manufacturers are now ramping up. President Trump mentioned that at his White House briefing yesterday. So there is also other antivirals that are in development in addition to hydroxychloroquine that are potentially going to be active against the virus itself. With respect to therapeutics that target the immune system and prevent the immune system from exerting injury on the lungs, there's a number of companies working on that. We're among them. I think that this is more focused on the severe patient population, patients who have already been infected with the virus but are now facing the downstream lung consequences. And are you, uh, your, one of your companies uh, you just mentioned is developing some uh, potentially promising therapies in that area? We are doing, we're doing our part. So we're advancing a therapy that's focused on one particular immunological target, really focused on potentially preventing acute lung injury in patients who are COVID-19 positive. Let's not forget even the name of the virus itself is SARS-CoV-2. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So the virus is named after that which it causes. And ultimately, that's ultimately what's placing people in ICUs and in the hospital. That's where we're focused. But I think many other companies are focused both on preventing disease through vaccines as well as through direct antivirals. I'm back with uh, Royvent Sciences founder and CEO Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, um, obviously much of the attention is focused right now on government response, government response in terms of um, the suppression measures that have been taken all over the country, uh, in terms of trying to get the number of um, uh, equipment that's needed, masks, ventilators, all of that kind of thing. Can you talk a little bit about the private sector's role here? America has a vibrant, uh, dynamic capitalist economy with huge amounts of investment in biomedicine technology. Tell us where that, what, what, where that leaves us and whether or not that gives us some hope here that, that from the private sector we may be able to see the kind, of, uh, the kind of response that's needed to tackle this. I think it does, Jerry, and I'd point you to two different categories. First is in the category of the diagnostics themselves. Ultimately, the tests that are now being rolled out are actually coming out because of the activities of private labs. That was impeded in the early days, in part because of trying to develop that test centrally at CDC, but is now taking place at private labs across the country. I think even more importantly, going forward, the same applies in the realm of therapeutics, where private companies, privately held companies across the country, across the world, are really stepping up and rising to the occasion to develop innovative therapies. I think we have tremendous capabilities to discover and develop new drugs. We have robust capital markets that fund the development of those drugs. But one thing we do need to fix is the incentives for the developers of drugs for infectious diseases. In contrast to developing cancer drugs, where we have a robust system that rewards those who really innovate in the field of, of oncology, we don't have that system in place for infectious diseases. In fact, we even have perverse incentives where for example, let's just take makers of antibiotics. We had two makers of antibiotics last year that went bankrupt in the United States. And those were companies developing two of the most innovative antibiotics. And the problem is the better your therapy is, in certain cases for infectious diseases, the more it's reserved for later or last line therapy. That means the better your drug, the less of it you sell, for example, in the field of, of antibiotics. Those are the kinds of incentives that we need to take a look at fixing so that the great capacity that we have in our private sector to innovate, that we actually put the right incentives in place to direct that innovation for times like these, treating infectious disease threats, much like we treat military threats or cybersecurity threats, we should really be looking at the possibility of infectious disease threats in the same way. There's been a lot of focus on the question of testing. Um, you know, we knew about this in, you know, from, my experience, from the experience in China in January. It became clearer, I think, in February that this was becoming a more serious issue. Uh, the availability of tests now is increasing rapidly. We are seeing now tests becoming available. But is yeah. it, it seems to have taken a long time. Were, were, we, were we late to the game here with testing? I think we were late to the game. I think this is not about placing blame, but learning lessons that inform how we perform in the future. Here, let's just take a, a little bit of a retrospective look at what happened. First, the CDC said they wanted to play the sole position in developing a test rather than making samples available to the private sector. And then second, the FDA stepped in in early February to say that all tests that were developed by labs needed to be validated using a centralized procedure specific to COVID-19. They did a good job of saying they were going to have a streamlined path for those companies. But like many regulatory actions, the best of intentions resulted in unintended consequences because many private labs took those announcements as a sign that it could be too burdensome for them to develop tests. 
And by the time the FDA changed course and lifted that restriction by the end of February, it was a bit too late for testing to have had the greatest possible impact that it would, even though many private labs have now stepped up to the plate and we're rolling out tests as fast as we can. And can you explain so why, testing is, why testing is so important now? Yeah, testing, testing, was, w testing is still important now because ultimately it informs the care of patients who show up at hospitals. Ideally, we would be in a position to test everyone, asymptomatic patients, symptomatic patients, and severe patients. We're still short on tests, and I think the, the doctors around the system are rightly prioritizing the more severe patients or at least symptomatic patients. Now, why is that important? Is it going to stop spread? Maybe. I think the time for that has passed. But at least it's going to inform the right care for these patients. For example, distinguishing COVID-19 from a different cause of the same symptoms. Very quickly, because we've got to take another break, but the government strategy so far really has been an attempt, first of all, mitigation and now suppression, in the hope or the expectation that if we can keep the number of cases down, uh, you know, this is over a year or so, we're going to have a vaccine. How realistic is the expectation that we could have a vaccine uh, in, say, uh, less than a year? I think we need to be measured about that expectation. As I mentioned, it is admirable what companies are stepping up to the plate to do. These are mRNA-based vaccines. We are charting uncharted territory here. There has not been a successful mRNA-based vaccine for other diseases in the past. And so we should be hopeful, but also guarded in not relying on that solution as we look at near-term solutions to, to mitigate the impact of this virus. I'm back with biotech entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek, uh, the president has said, lots of people have said, we are now in effect in a kind of a wartime situation. America is at war. Wars change countries dramatically, radically. They change the way people relate to each other, the way they relate to government, the role of government. Uh, they change the politics and society. How do you think this is going to change this country? Look, I'm an optimist. I think that this crisis actually provides us an occasion to rediscover our shared sense of American solidarity. And if that's a silver lining in all of this, then I think it's going to be one that we should be, we should be grateful for. I will say that in times of crisis, we might face a temptation, as we have in our past, to surrender to calls for authoritarianism. We've seen it in the past during the Great Depression, when you heard some Americans calling for learning lessons from the efficiency of Nazi Germany. Today, we're hearing some early whispers of the same for China's success story in combating the virus. But I actually think today, in this particular moment in the COVID epidemic, provides us an occasion to remember that authoritarianism may actually have contributed to turning that initial local epidemic into a global pandemic through the suppression of physicians, the ordering of physicians in China to cease testing and destroy samples. And while China has reported a decline in new cases using their autocratic methods, I think is also an opportunity now for America to step up to show that even as a liberal democracy, we too can conquer this virus. I think it's also an occasion for us to remember that, look, all Americans, male or female, black or white, Republican or Democrat for that matter, share an equal vulnerability to this virus and really a reminder for us that we all truly share something in common here. And do you think that, just on that point, I want to elaborate on that, that that will... You know, this has been a very divided country. We're part divided along partisan lines. People, as you say, have been identifying themselves increasingly in the last 20 years on their, their race, their sex, their um, sexual orientation. Is, is, is this really, is it really possible that this could... I remember 9-11. 9-11 came along, people said the same thing about 9-11, and we were, we were united. The country was united for about a year afterwards, and then we were back to squabbling again. Is this really likely to change? I think it is, I, at least in the near term, and I hope we take it for the long run. In the, two, in the 20 years since 9-11, we've done a great job of celebrating our differences and sometimes quibbling over them. I think this is an occasion to remember our commonality. And to that end, I mean, I'll tell you a, story, a couple stories, Jerry. I was talking to my wife last night. She's an ear, nose, throat doctor. She's three and a half weeks into maternity leave. We just had a child three and a half weeks ago. She That's told good. me last night that as a ear, nose, throat doctor, she is going back to the hospital in the next couple of days. I was uncertain about that decision, but she told me that the fireman doesn't run from the fire when the building is burning. And I would say that doctors like her across the country are our true American heroes right now. Even at our own company, I've been on the phone around the clock with our development team trying to advance our therapeutic working with regulators. I think the employees at our company, I think the employees at FDA are true American heroes. Now, of course, we all wish this crisis never occurred, but if we are to take something productive from it, 
let it remind us of what we all share in common as a people. And I think it can also remind us of what true heroism is all about. As we saw on 9-11, let us, you know, I think take this as an opportunity to discover something that might have been missing over the last couple of decades since. Vivek, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you to your wife. Uh, congratulations to you both. But thank you very much indeed for joining us.